Hi, this is David from UCR Supplemental Instruction here again to talk to you about Physics 40B. And this time we'll be talking about the thermodynamic cycle problems. We'll be getting a little deeper than we were in the last video. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a pretty good framework for how to solve these problems in the future. So first off, uh, all these problems are about a cycle of some sort. So here on the PV diagram, I've drawn out an auto cycle. It doesn't really matter which cycle it is because hopefully you should be able to do this for all types of cycles, not just ones that look familiar, like this one. Um, the primary ones you'll be working with are probably the auto cycle and the Brayton cycle. Uh, but again, just don't get too married to the shape of one of these. So what we know about cycles is that in order to be cyclical, they have to be a continuous contour somewhere on the graph. So you have some enclosed space on the inside, and then it's uh, created by these different processes. So here we have four processes and four states, that being the point where these processes meet. So right here is point one, point two, point three, and point four. The numbering is arbitrary. Uh, we're just going in order clockwise so it makes sense. All right, and then these questions are usually asking something about the pressure, volume, temperature at any of these points, or uh, more about the processes, the uh, thermal energy, the change of thermal energy, the work, or the heat. So usually you'll be asked to describe first off what processes are these. So first off, these green lines, uh, it's probably uh, something we can just tell by inspection. If they're vertical lines, that means they're operating at a constant volume. So we can say that these are both isochoric or constant volume processes. So that already gives us a lot of information. And so for these other two, you might remember that these curved lines can be either isothermal or adiabatic because they look really similar. In this case, it will be given to you that these two processes are adiabatic. So that's for the uh, red ones. Actually, we'll make this text red to uh, represent that. So you have adiabatic processes, and then the other processes are isochoric. So again, you might not have two isochoric and two adiabatic processes. What's important is that you figure it out. Maybe you have isobaric processes, maybe you have isothermal processes, maybe you don't have adiabatic processes, maybe you have several types. Um, well, it really doesn't matter because what we want to do is kind of go point by point, process by process, solving for all these potential variables that we could be given. So to start off with these problems, I have to give you some information, right? So let's say that the information we're given starts here at point one. Let's pretend that known, and then it's black, are, let's see, we'll call this P1 for the pressure at point one, and we'll say V1 as well. So at this point, what we know is that uh, it's because this is an isochoric process, V1 is equal to V4. So those are the sorts of uh, connections you'll need to be making along the way. So I've taken the liberty of creating a table here with our known and unknown values. I've thrown in some other known values that we'll get to at the end. So um, I put in V2 as a given value in T1. Um, and so the values in blue are going to be the values that we've determined for ourselves. Uh, first off, V4 is equal to V1 here because this is an I squared process. So the volume at uh, point 0.1 has to be the same as 0.4. Now let's keep going then, and we're going to take this, as I said before, one process at a time. So we'll start with process one to two. So going from one, process two, which is an adiabat. Um, let's just see what we can do about that. So first off, if you remember about your adiabatic processes, you might recall then that one of the rules for this is that pressure times volume, to the power of gamma, I'm gonna use G uh, for gamma, uh, it usually is written out as the, the Greek character, which looks something like this. So, and it's just V to the power of gamma, not P. Uh, so volume to the power of gamma. Um, what we know about this is that it's equal to a constant value. Um, what that is, you only know if you know all three of these, but what that means is that if we take the pressure volume and gamma at point one, um, and the pressure volume and gamma at point two, gamma will be the same. Um, but they'll be equal to the same constant, even though the pressure and volume would be different. So we can actually expand this. If we just say P1, V1, 
uh, equals constant, which is also equal to P2 times V2, also to the power of that same gamma. So just knowing what we know, we know P1 and V1, and we know V2, so we can solve for P2 this way just by dividing under uh, V2 to the power of gamma. So you'll have P1 times V1 over V2 to the power of gamma equals P2. And so with that, we already have another term that we've solved for. So let's write that in. So we now know P2. OK, so that's good. But we're still missing something from this point. So another part of adiabatic processes, I'm kind of hammering out know, this uh, adiabatic process stuff because it's pretty common. And you also see this in a Brayton cycle. So you'll probably be dealing with these on a final. Um, how do we get the temperature? Well, ideal gas laws still apply. And we know that uh, if we want to manipulate this a little bit, we can swap out the pressure for, and then just in general terms, pressure equals n times r times t divided by v. So we can substitute this quantity in. And so uh, if we take, again, p1, what we'll have is, or not p1, point one, sorry, uh, instead of having the pressure in here, we'll have n r times. Uh, v1 so divided by v1, um, but then times v1 to the power of gamma equals a constant. And so again, what this constant is isn't really important, but we know that n and r are going to be constant. We're not bleeding off any molecules. So we could also, well, I forgot the t, the most important part. <laughs> uh, we could also divide these n and r out of this equation into a constant. And so some constant divided by n times r, which is another constant, is sort of a constant. So what we can do is just divide them under, but it doesn't matter that we say divide by n r here, because this constant doesn't matter. We don't we're not have to solve for it at all. You can just omit this from here and solve for p2 directly. And we'll be doing the same thing. So that part's actually going to be unnecessary. But of course, this will also apply to the other side of the equation, or the other point. So t I just this by t1, t2 divided by v2 times v2 to the power of gamma. Um, and so here again, you can solve for temperature. Knowing temperature at um, point one, we can solve for it at point two. And for algebraic clarity, this is v1 to the negative first power, and then being multiplied by v1 to the power of g, so, or sorry, gamma. Um, if we want to combine them into something that looks nice, we could say v to the power of, and then you're, you add exponents and you multiply them together, right? So v minus 1, gamma minus 1. And we could use that instead of just having two separate uh, v1s. Uh, not a big deal, though, but it's probably what you'll see in derivations. So knowing this all, we can do the same thing that we did before. We know v1, we know v2, we know gamma, we know t1. So your only unknown in this equation is t2, and we can have that solved for. Okay, so now we've gotten all of our information based off of just what we knew about point one, and now we solve for everything about point two. And you're going to repeat that process going from point two to point three, uh, process two to three, you could call it, and from three to four. So I'm not going to belabor that too much more because you are essentially repeating the same steps. Uh, what I do want to talk about a little bit, though, is the energy, work, and heat associated with each of these. So you know with uh, work, for example, that it's equal to the negative um, p pressure times the integral of or the integral of pressure with respect to volume. Um, for these vertical lines, which are ice core processes, that's zero. But from an adiabatic process, you know that Q is zero. So these are only doing work. I also know that the derivative is negative. So Let's see, how can we display this? Um, the area under here, which is just from the process one to two, is work we're doing on the gas. So it'd be a positive term, but it's not what we as the user of this machine want. And then the work done by this other adiabatic process three to four will include all this because it's everything below the curve, right? So it's the space in the interior plus this exact same space covered by process one to two. But this is going, you know, pay attention to the arrows, right? It's negative, so 
this is work being done by the gas, and therefore it's work that we get done by whatever engine this is. So the total net work done is what's left inside of this, right? Because we're subtracting the total area under the curve minus area under this curve. So when it comes to processes, you're essentially just doing the same thing, right? You're using information about one of these stages to learn about the other. Um, and then, you know, you're making implications off these. So for example, we know that work is purely work, no heat uh, is done in these two adiabatic processes. So any heat that occurs, um, and well, only uh, energy transfer by heat can occur in these isochore processes, again, because the integral is zero, um, then you know that heat goes in or out depending on what you're seeing. But it's very much the same thing that we're doing here, where you just use information about one, you know, you solve for the work done, you use that to solve for something else. Um, so that's all for now. I think next week we'll probably be just finishing up with efficiencies. Um, there's not a whole lot more to go. This is pretty much the end of this class. There's a little bit more nuance that you'll be seeing, but this is the gist of it. And if you can do these pretty consistently, then you're set up pretty well for the final. All right, thanks. Hope you learned something, and I'll see you next time.